Hello again and welcome to another Morty and Glory Warhammer 40k video. In today's video, I want to compare and contrast three different kinds of Warhammer 40k army lists, looking at their advantages and disadvantages. We're going to cast our ever critical eye over the concept of themed lists, skewed lists and take all comers lists. And you know what? That'll do for the intro. Normally I go on way too long with these kind of things. And with this exact segment, I'm defeating the point of trying to have a short intro. But without further ado, let's fix bayonets and charge right into today's episode. Good news, everyone. Bolt Action 3rd Edition is just around the corner. And the best way that you can prepare for this new and exciting edition of one of my favorite games of all time is by getting yourself some new Bolt Action miniatures. But where can you get these models? Well, don't worry, I've got you covered. There's an affiliate link down in the description below that will take you straight to the Warlord Games website and you can get your World War II miniature fix right from the source. <laughs> By using the affiliate link down in the description below, not only will you be getting some awesome models, but you will also be supporting the channel. A massive thank you to Warlord Games for sponsoring this video and now let's get back into the action. So recently in one of my live streams, I had a member of the audience, a valued conscript, come forward and say, Mordian, could you explain the difference between a skew list and a tack list? And what the hell is a theme list? I'm just getting into Warhammer 40k and I'm trying to understand all of these different terms. And I thought that was a really, really good question. So not only did I answer it in the live stream, but I also thought I would make a video here. And it's one of the things that myself as a veteran player often forgets. It's one of the big mistakes that I often make is that we throw around terms like tactless and skew and themed and memed and all that kind of stuff these different concepts and ideas of lists but to a new player coming in this is like speaking a foreign language it's all these strange concepts and so it's a good idea to occasionally sit down and just go through some of these basic concepts these basic principles of Warhammer 40k and in this case of army list building but with all that said let's get into our first kind of army list the themed army. Like it says on the tin, a themed army is one that is going to be built around a concept or a theme, and there might be a bit of a narrative, a bit of a story that is being injected into the army. And almost anything can be used as a theme. It really comes down to what the player, the person that's building the army, wants to achieve. Perhaps you really like the Death Corps of Creek, so you decide you're going to build an army that feels very much like a World War I style list with lots of infantry and artillery. Or maybe it's something in your real life that has inspired you to build a certain kind of army list. Perhaps you've just seen Black Hawk Down or We Were Soldiers and you love this idea of having an air cavalry style army. Or maybe there is a historical influence. A lot of guard players do have a love of history and that love does tend to influence and decide what kind of army they want to get into. Maybe you love the idea of having Praetorians holding the line, that thin red line, or you love the idea of the mass tactics, the mass battle plans of the Soviet Union, and that inspires you to go down a Valhallen style army list. The point is, is many themed army lists are based on the player's interest and something that they want to try and recreate on the tabletop. Now, some themed army lists are not particularly powerful. For example, the aforementioned air cavalry is really struggling in 10th edition right now because the aircraft rules just aren't very good. It looks phenomenal on the battlefield, but it's rarely going to win many games. If you're more competitively minded, you might struggle to understand why someone would spend so much time and money on building an army that isn't necessarily very good, but the pleasure and enjoyment of running a weaker themed list doesn't necessarily come from its power, it comes from having an idea putting the time and effort into making that idea a reality and then just getting to put it on the table. You don't care if you're winning games or not. You just love the reaction that you're getting from other players as you unveil this really cool concept. However, that does not mean that themed lists are all 
terrible. You can have some very, very powerful themed lists. A good example of what I would say is a downright competitive tournament winning themed guard army at the moment is a mechanized style one. Having lots of infantry mounted up in dedicated transports, supporting that with a handful of tanks and artillery, having lots of armor on the board, that is really good and it's because not only is it themed but it also plays into certain strengths of 10th edition such as vehicles and monsters being really good at the moment but this kind of naturally leads us on to our second kind of army which is the skew list now the line between a powerful themed list and a genuine skew list can sometimes be a blurry one. You see often theme lists will lean into a certain kind of unit or certain data sheet and skew lists will do the same thing. The difference between a skew list and a theme list often comes down to intent. In a theme list, you have a cool concept that someone's tried to do as well as they possibly can do, but they're kind of operating within a bunch of restrictions that they've put on themselves. A skew list isn't operating under any restrictions. It's finding a powerful data sheet or a powerful set of data sheets and it is spamming them. It is exploiting them. It is trying to get the absolute most out of them in an effort to break the game. One example of this from many editions ago was Wave Serpent Spam. And I know a whole bunch of veterans from 7th edition just had some Vietnam style flashbacks. In 7th edition, the Eldar Wave Serpent was without a doubt the best dedicated transport. It had incredible firepower, incredible durability, and was ridiculously cheap. And back in the day, there was no such thing as rule of three or anything like that so you could pretty much spam as many of these things as you wanted and for a long time they dominated the competitive meta of sixth and seventh edition i guess the big difference between a themed list and a skew list is a theme list is trying to bring together a multitude of different data sheets that may share similar characteristics to build up a theme, to build up a concept, and to try and run with a certain style of warfare. Whereas a skew list is trying to find an exploit in the game, trying to find something that is under-costed or broken, and is going to spam that as many times as they can without having any concept or notion of this fitting within a story or a theme. It's just taking a lot of a few good units. It is important, though, not to vilify and demonize these skew lists. Many of them are just competitive armies that are trying to be as powerful as possible. And in a tournament environment, there really is nothing wrong with that. At the end of the day, if you're going to a tournament, you should be trying to take the most powerful list that you can if your goal is to go and win that event. So theme lists are sometimes powerful, sometimes weak, but they're often built around a concept skew lists are trying to get as much efficiency as possible and sometimes this involves spamming a few of the same unit but now we come over to our final kind of list the tack list take all comers these armies often try and have a little bit of everything so that when they go into a battle they're always going to have the right tool for the job a take all comers list may consist of a bit of infantry, a bit of artillery, a bit of tanks, some elite units, some fast moving units, a few infiltrates, a few scouts. There's just a whole smorgasbord of different things that gives the player a lot of resources that they can draw upon. So if in one game they get paired into someone with a lot of tanks, they want to have enough anti-tank to be able to at least hold their own in that clash of armor. If they come across a lot of infantry, well they're going to need enough anti horse to be able to thin those units down and make them combat ineffective. The advantage of a take all comers list is that no matter what it gets paired into, it should have the solution for that problem. The disadvantage of a take all comers list is sometimes by trying to solve everything, you don't bring enough of anything. 
Maybe you think you've got enough anti-tank, but then you come across someone with a skew list who is running like 13, 14, 15 vehicles, and suddenly your anti-tank is getting overwhelmed, and it doesn't matter if you manage to take out two or three or four of the enemy tanks in the first couple of turns. From turn three onwards, the enemy's targeted your anti-tank, and now you are in a bad place. Likewise, you might think you've got enough anti-infantry, but then someone turns up with a hundred Black Templars and a Black Tide, and you just get stat checked and you don't have what it takes to bring those hordes of power armor down before they crash into your lines and start chopping you to pieces. Now, an example of one of these take all comers lists is Hybrid Guard. This is where you have maybe 60 to 80 foot stocking infantry in your list, a couple of silent squads for deep striking down and doing some secondaries and maybe sniping some hiding enemy units, maybe a basilisk or two to rain down shells on those enemy units that are trying to close quickly or that are trying to hide, and three or four tanks so that if the enemy's got some big monsters, you've got some big guns to try and counter them. Now, I suppose the big question is, do skew lists beat fundamental lists, beat these take all comers lists? And the answer is yes, but also no. What you tend to find with skewed armies is that they do run roughshod over people that aren't prepared for them. Take the aforementioned Black Tide. If you just haven't brought enough anti-space marine infantry guns, if you've got lots of one-shot LAS cannons, you are not going to be able to beat that and it's going to run over you. But these things are like glass houses, like glass hammers. They hit really hard, but the moment that you can deal with them, they shatter. It is the great, I don't know if irony is the right word, but we'll roll with it. It's the great irony of Skewless is that they feel supremely powerful until suddenly they don't. I ran my Unending Swarm Tyranids. This was before they got nerfed into the ground. And I played two games where people just could not deal with 240 little bugs running at them. And then I got into my third game and I played against Thousand Suns and I got tabled in three turns. He had a take all comers Thousand Suns list. He had a mix of anti-infantry and anti-tank and all this kind of good stuff. But his list was just very good, very powerful, very well optimized. It could handle any situation that it came across. And so suddenly, my list went from feeling very powerful, overwhelming people, to getting utterly herb stomped. And this is the eternal war, the never-ending battle that has been going on in the competitive community for a long time. Are tack lists better than skew lists? Should you spam or should you have a little bit of everything? And... Honestly, there is no right way all the time. It really depends on what is going on in the meta. The meta being the competitive ecosystem, the environment that we play in. Sometimes there will be armies that can do everything, that have all the anti-tank, all the anti-infantry, they have quantity and quality. And those armies will be super powerful. And those armies will be tack lists that can do it all, have an answer for everything, and win games by just having a solution for all the problems that they come across. But then you might have a codex that comes out or a new army list that gets developed and hits the meta hard, which has found an undercosted data sheet or has found a particularly broken combination and it's just spamming the crap out of it. And that's taking the meta by storm. It's a constantly ever-shifting battle, and it's never set in stone. So if you're wondering, should I go for a themed list or a skewed list or a take all comers list, I would say go with what is going to give you personally the most enjoyment. Are you going to enjoy trying to find a hack, trying to find an exploit? Then go for that. There's no problem with that. Don't let anyone make you feel bad for doing that. I like taking skewed lists all the time. Are you someone who's not really that bothered about winning games, but you've got a really cool idea in your head and you want to try and execute that idea? Go for a themed list. And hey, if it ends up being powerful at some point in this ever swirling, changing meta, then hey, that's good for you, right? And if you're someone that loves the idea of taking a perfectly balanced army and you're not trying to cheese your way to victory, you're not trying to win by exploiting the game, but you're trying to win by having 
a perfectly honed blade that you can use your skill with to try and get to the top of the table via your tactical genius, then maybe the tact list is the way for you to go. But of course, all of this is just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Are you someone who likes to run tack lists and you like to try and have an answer for every problem? Or do you like to try and like beat the game by finding an exploit and breaking it? Or are you just here to run a cool themed list? Let me know your favorite way to play down in that comment section. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to smash that like button and also subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more during glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patrons these are the war masters the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. To a heartfelt thank you to Alex Dengal, Bon Bon Vert, Lord Pryor, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, Try Again Bragg, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Seriously guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video. And of course, as always, see you guys next time.